Okay, so let's let's start. So um, a really warm welcome to everybody from myself, uh, Thomas Chalmers and Jane Welsh. And we're delighted to have you join us on this session called Developing as a Leader, Reading, Reflecting or Role Models. Now we've got a fantastic panel for you today who are going to bring to life uh, much of the, the theory of leadership. But before we start, I thought I'd give you a bit of background on the research on which um, this seminar is based. And that research is really what informs us in the coaching that we do with uh, leaders and their teams in the finance and professional services sector. So again, welcome to those who joined. Um, and I'm just going to run through very briefly an overview of the research that underpins this session. And indeed, the, the four panellists that I'll introduce shortly have contributed to the re this research already. So just going on to this slide, um, the, the research that we've been undertaking with, with, uh, with, with Jane um, has looked at a number of factors, and it's been brought together through uh, both questionnaire and in-depth one-to-one interviews, and in, indeed all panellists have contributed to the research, as I said earlier. And an interesting number of themes have come out, and we'll, we'll probably flesh some of these out during the panel discussion. But what, what we're showing here is a schematic of the development of a leader over time. And what's come out of the research are say, three themes that we'd like to to look into further. And the first is, to what extent, if anything, do leaders rely and take input from formal development, such as attending a course or uh, reading an article or a book on uh, leadership? The second is, how do we bring that sense of self, our, our own identity, our personal values to the table as a leader? And quite often, we only get a sense of that, of, of ourself, by reflection, hence the reflection in the title of the seminar. And then thirdly, to what extent have the many people that may have you know, been on the journey with us, family, teachers, colleagues, other leaders, to what extent have they influenced and shaped the leaders we are today? So, to join us um, today, we have four uh, fantastic leaders who are going to help bring these concepts to life. Um, and these are shown here. Now we have uh, Jay, our own Jane Welsh, who's a consultant with Leading Figures. Uh, Jane is going to facilitate the conversation. And Jane is also heavily involved in the diversity project and brings with her many years of experience from the investment world. Uh, Deb Clark is on the panel, Global Head of Investment Research at Mercer. Uh, delighted also to have Joanna Munro, Global Chief Investment Officer of HSBC Global Asset Management, and Mitesh Sheth, CEO of Reddington. Great to have him, and Stephen Gibb, who is a corporate finance partner at Shepherd and Wedderburn in Scotland, and uh, he is also brings experience um, of being a CEO of Shepherd and Wedderburn for many years. So um, delighted to have you all here um, on the panel. But before we um, move on, I just a bit of housekeeping. Um, you can ask questions as some of you have been doing um, through the Q&A button on the control bar. And Thomas Chalmers will be monitoring that to ensure that we get as many questions answered as far as possible. Uh, and Thomas will also close the session at 11.50. And finally, um, just an answer to a few people the, the session will be recorded and uh, we hope to, we will provide a link to the recording on our website after the event. So um, 
thank you again, panelists. And I'm just going to unmute you to start the next session. So if you just bear with me. I will stop sharing and pass over to you, Jane, to start the session. Thank you very much for that, Russell. Um, what we thought we'd do before we, um, before we um, move to the panel session is to have a, sh a quick poll, um, just to get your reaction as attendees of the title of the session. So when you've been developing as a leader and everyone is a leader to some extent, have you relied on reading or have you relied on self-reflection or have you learnt from others, role models and other people? So perhaps, Russell, if we could have our first poll. Yep. So you've got those three options. So if you'd like to uh, put in the one that's had the most impact on you and then we'll see what the results are. We have a result yet? So uh, very interesting that uh, probably not unexpected that people have really learned from other people to a large extent um, and reading articles, the theory has probably been the least important. Um, so I think perhaps we'll pick up on some of those themes as we, we go to the panel session. So thank you for that. So I'd now like to invite each of the panelists to just give a quick description of themselves. I think it would be good for us to learn a little bit more about them. So perhaps if I could start with Joanna, and if you could describe your, your leadership style in a, in a few words. Uh, thanks, Jane. I, I'm not sure what my leadership style is called, um, but this is what I do. Um, so my approach is to set the strategic direction in a, in a high level um, action plan, then to get the right people into the key roles um, and, and roles where they can thrive, uh, and then to try to create the right environment for them to be successful. So that's, that's my approach. Okay, thank you, Joanna. If I could turn to Mitesh. Thanks, Jane. Hi, everybody. Yep, I would definitely echo what Joanna said. If I talk a little bit more specifically about my style, I'd say I'm very consultative as a leader. So I'm interested in hearing uh, what people's issues and perspectives are. I'm very open, um, so I want to be available. I'm open to challenge um, and open to hearing other views. I'm, I think I'm an agile leader, which means I'm constantly iterating and getting it wrong um, and not being too scared to try something, fail and learn and build on it. Um, and I'm deeply committed to diversity and inclusion as a leader. So I'm fundamentally looking for different opinions, people who disagree with me and think differently. Thank you for that. Stephen, could you describe your style? Uh, yeah, I mean, without repeating what's just been said, because I agree with all of that, um, I suppose, uh, what would be said about me, I'm a people person, uh, I think probably above all else. Uh, and I'm also uh, determined and passionate, which people would translate as stubborn and a bit hot-headed at times. Um, and quietly competitive. So um, I, I don't believe in winning over everything else, but and I like to play, play a longer game in getting the business to where it needs to get to, but, but there is that in there too. Uh, what Joanna and the said uh, particularly. Thank you. Finally, Deb, can you oh. give it a go? <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Yes, it's, it's tough probably to be the last person. So I think I've always tried to be myself as a leader, so to be authentic and be open and honest and inclusive. And sometimes that means I probably take a little bit longer to make decisions, which I'm absolutely fine with if I've encouraged those different views. Um, someone who likes to listen 
and really to encourage others to find the solution. So very much the same as Joanna, so that they can be as successful as they can be as themselves. Thank you. So one of the aspects of uh, one of Russell's slides was the sort of innate qualities that someone has. And so perhaps, Debs, we could stay with you and explore this idea of whether leaders are, are born or made. Um, yeah, I guess it's, I guess not surprisingly, I believe it's a combination of the two. So many people, in my view, have the ability to manage a team or they can learn to do that. So I was given team responsibility in my mid 20s and I thought, gosh, somebody believes in me, but equally, I feel I need to know more. So I signed up to an open university course about leadership and, and about managing. And I did discover through those insights and meeting different people who were on this course, that leadership is something different than just managing a group. So I think people can learn to manage, but leadership is really about another level. So it's about taking that responsibility, um, having confidence to try and to fail things, as Matesh talked about earlier on, and learning from that and making yourself better. So having a good self-awareness, and it's about having humility. And, and I see really a leader as being somebody who is succeeding through others. And because of those soft factors and that humility and the ability to sort of challenge yourself, some of that I think comes from your DNA and perhaps some of your upbringing. So I think there are elements you can learn, but actually a lot of it is about your self um, traits that you have and if you can develop those over time. Okay. Thank you for that. Stephen, I'd now like to maybe turn to you and, and your reflections on how you've developed as a leader. Uh, yeah. Um... So, so I am no longer the managing partner. I was for about seven years, uh, and that's given me some some time to actually reflect on that. I think one of the interests. So, I was from a professional services background, law firm, seventy five partners, five hundred people, four offices around the UK. So, I think um, the the one bit of formal management training I had was I got packed off to Harvard to do the leading professional services firm course, which I'm sure a lot of people have been uh, have done or seen which i which i found a really really good uh socratic method of teaching which was scary from someone who comes from the old uk of sit and be talked at uh, type method but but very very good um highlights um i think learn uh, surround yourself with good people which i'm sure everybody's in this uh, in the same boat for me, um, coming from a people business in a service industry, it kind of starts and ends with people. So uh, my philosophy was always clients, people, technology, uh, and and move the business forward through, through all of those. Um, big part of the role is effectively coaching uh, and um, helping, uh, helping others develop, uh, not taking the monkeys off yourself, uh, but actually giving them back, but helping people work with them. Um, taking decisions, uh, I think um, what you talked about, I think, Joanna, in, in the sense of um, taking decisions, but not only it was devs, taking decisions, but, um, but taking time to reflect what you need to, it's, it's far more important than stagnation. Uh, I'm an ideas person, um, so I need completer finishers in the team. Mm -hmm. so know, know, your, know your, your, your limitations and, and, and what you have to do. Um, I'm also often told that I like to be liked, uh, which is an interesting refrain, um, which I don't regard necessarily as a bad thing. I think you've, when, you, when you're a leader in a business like, uh, like ours, um, you, have to, you have to put on your game face when you're in the office, you have to embody the culture, you have to be visible. You also have to take the tough decisions. And if you're taking the tough decisions around people and quietly exiting uh, partners and colleagues, do it in private uh, and give them the dignity. And it doesn't matter if you uh, if, if if people think you like to be liked, as long as you deal with them properly. Um, hard work is good, but you need to make time time to think, um, time to uh, have a holiday. One of the things I did was I, I had a rule that whenever I went on a two week holiday, uh, I switched my email off, uh, and I told anybody that wanted. If they, if they wanted me, text me, and the, the volume of people went like that. Uh, and it actually worked really well. It empowered people, and it meant that I got more holiday out of it. Uh, public speaking, 
Um, I that was my single biggest fear on taking on the role. Uh, so I knew when I took it on, I had to work at it. Um, Harvard helped that realization, uh, particularly that Socratic method, scary stuff. So went and got various coaching. Uh, there's a business called Voice Business. If any of you ever want uh, speaking coaching, absolutely fantastic. Run by a couple of actors. They're really, really good. Um, I, I script things. I've got one here. Uh, I, uh, I rarely use it, but it's there as a prompt. Um, I'm also probably a poster boy for imposter syndrome, which again, that course was really helpful on. Uh, actually being told by someone for the first time, 80% of the Fortune 500 CEOs have it. They're in the category of better performing CEOs. Um, was really, really helpful, I think, for, for me in terms of thinking, okay, this isn't a weakness, it's a strength. So, so deal with it and move on. I could waffle for ages. I'll stop because I'm conscious of time. Thanks very much, Stephen. I'd now like to turn to Mitesh um, because you came into your lead your first leadership role was not in the corporate world, and, and I think that's sort of helped to shape your view of lead leadership. So it'd be great to hear that story. Thanks, Jane. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I started working. Um, uh, and you know, was was involved with teams initially at Aon and then at Willis Towers Watson before I went to Henderson, but I wasn't really managing people in in those uh, kind of first ten years of my career. However, from my early twenties, I was working with a youth organisation um, and an organisation that had been instrumental in my own development as a um, um, as kind of I'd grown and over time I'd taken on more leadership responsibilities and. I think at the peak was responsible for 800 young people around the UK, as well as their kind of mentors and the volunteers that were kind of coordinating all the activities for those young people across all the kind of cities and towns across the UK. So that's really where I learned leadership far before I was asked to manage a team at work. And I think what's interesting about learning that in the charity sector and particularly working with volunteers um, not paid staff, so there were no paid staff and young people was that I couldn't demand their followership. Um, they didn't have to be there, they chose to be there. Um, I couldn't buy their, you know, their, their labour, their efforts. And that was really important and it taught me really early on that really at the heart of leadership is to, to inspire, to mobilise, to bring people together into some form of collective action. And just because they turn up every day doesn't mean that they're fully bought in to do that. You have to do the hard work of, 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 um, of engaging them. Um, and I think that was a really important lesson that I learned in that voluntary sector. And so when I started to take on small and then larger teams of, of people to manage, um, you know, it really started with me wanting to understand where each of them were, but critically seeing myself as a servant, um, as someone who was responsible to them and to bring out the best in them. And I always kind of viewed it as if I could align the business's objectives with their personal objectives, if I could align the challenges the business faces with the challenges they face and what they want to learn and achieve, then over and above their objectives and paying them to come and work and promoting and rewarding them fairly, actually there's real magic in them wanting to do um, and wanting to, to go on that journey with you. So I guess that's been my leadership journey, at least at the outset and how I approached it. Did that answer the question, Jane? Oh, yeah, that's great. And you've also talked about the loneliness of being a leader and how you've managed to, to with, cope with that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I became CEO four years ago now, and I, you know, I was asked to do it. It's not something I had I thought that I would be doing. I was kind of flattered, definitely felt like an imposter having never done it before. Um, and what I did, what, uh, what came naturally to me is to read a bunch of books, <laughs> as many as I could, that would give me uh, a quick start and read, read loads of Harvard Business Review articles and thought, that's it, I know how to do this, I'll give it a bloody good shot. Um, but absolutely, the thing that I would describe kind of the most profound feeling over the last four years is just the fact that 
everybody ultimately their problems, the issues, the challenges come to you. And for me, that was in a founder run business um, alongside the, the, the kind of wider executive team in the firm and it all stopping with me and not having anyone to talk to about that. And then as we evolved to seek external funding and bring in private equity funding again, I felt like I was in the middle of this and didn't have people to have honest conversations with, nor did I feel I was receiving honest critical feedback. And that had been so, so key to my development to, to date. Um, I kind of talked about, my, about it to my wife um, and she eventually tired of me um, bringing all my problems home and trying to seek counsel from her. Um, and, and so the, the key things for me had been one, hiring a coach. So a coach had been essential, someone dispassionate, impartial, who didn't know about our business from a completely different industry, but could just be there and help me process my thoughts. And I realized I was less effective when my head was full of thoughts and emotions. And I'm naturally someone who represses my feelings. And that was a bad place to be. You've, you've got to be able to express it. And the, the single biggest tool I found is journaling. Yes, I'd always been very keen on taking feedback and reflecting and iterating much to the theme of today's topic. But journaling was probably the single most powerful tool I found because it shortened the feedback loop to every day. Now, every single day I could ask myself, what did I do? What did I do right? What could I have done differently? How did I leave people feeling? Did I make the right decisions? Um, did I consult? Did I seek a dissenting opinion? I could ask myself those questions. I could also process what I was feeling so that I could act on that. And so it's been absolutely key in being able to have a clear head and being able to think through and process those emotions um, alongside having a coach. Those would be the two, two, two critical things for my mental health uh, and my even ability to be a leader, let alone uh, try and be successful at it. Thank you for that, Mitesh. Does anyone else on the panel want to sort of pick up on this point about feedback and, and looking after yourself, those two pieces? Yeah, I mean, I think both are very important. And I think, unfortunately, in the current environment, we don't always get the honest feedback we like. So I tend to have a, an inner circle of people that I trust, and they can be either in the business or outside of the business, who I do rely on to give me more honest feedback than I would get in a sort of typical 360 degree feedback. And it's that small group of people that I can test those ideas with that are perhaps a little bit wacky or a little bit different. And I test them with those before I then take them to a broader group. So I found that little inner circle of, you know, half a dozen people who I can trust and, and use for that sounding board. Anyone else on the panel got had any insights on this? I just mentioned, um, so this difficulty of getting constructive feedback, I think it is a challenge for a lot of us. And so I now have one of our non-executive directors um, I find very helpful. She's somebody who knows me well, she knows our business um, and just very insightful. So I, I'm very fortunate that I have somebody that I can have those kind of exchanges with. It's, it's really important. Super. I think probably it's it's time to see if there are any questions, Thomas. Yes, Jane, there are. There are a number of questions co coming in. Um, perhaps one from Gavin Harvey that uh, everyone will probably have a view on. It's directed at Deb. Uh, Deb uh, and Gavin asks, um, could you expand upon what you mean by succeeding through others? Yeah, so, so in the context that I was using that was, I think as, as a leader, and I think Stephen, you referenced it in you, when you were talking, which is, I'm not there to solve the problems. I'm there to help people solve problems themselves. So I, over the years, I've said to people, don't come to me and tell me this is the problem. Come to me and say, here's a problem. Here's a solution. Does that sound about right? Or if there's a task that we have to do, let's go part way along the road, check back in. Does this look to be the right direction? So it's, it's allowing people to thrive. And I get the the best pleasure when people find their own solutions because then they own the solution they run with it they have the passion and certainly when we report I'm always keen to make sure people are given that credit and very much as Stephen said any issues we take behind closed doors it's very much about empowering the team and making sure my success is surrounding myself by by very bright people and making sure they succeed thank you any other questions? Anyone else want to add to that or, or do we move to another question? I might just add a sentence to say that, you know, for me, um, coming again from a founder-led business, it's really 
natural to kind of step into those shoes and be expected to be kind of that single person that everybody goes to or has that profile or is expected to do everything. And I was um, very clear from the outset that I wanted to build a bench of leaders uh, and whatever profile or work or success we had would be shared by that group. And I think that's quite hard because it does mean you've got to say no when people are asking you to say, can you do this? Can you set this up? Can you talk about this? Can you lead on this? To say, well, actually, no, why don't you? Yeah. Uh, and, and it is very much, I've seen another question on the Q&A that's really about finding the right people for the right problem. Um, and I know we'll come to COVID later, but I knew I wasn't the right person to lead us through that. I don't have the risk, risk mindset that was needed, but my COO did and she led us. Um, through the initial stages of that. So I think it is about c cultivating a whole team of leaders and knowing where their strengths and weaknesses are and knowing where to play them. Thank you. Thomas, any other questions? Yes, I, I think this question in from Sarah Smart really is perhaps the one that, that, that Mitesh has alluded to there. Do you think organisations are good enough at recognising which characteristics of a leader they need at a particular point in time and making sure they get that sort of leader. Who should we pose that question to? Joanna, do you want to talk about, about that? Yeah, I, mean, I think um, it's not just organisations, I think also individuals. Um, you know, we have our own leadership styles. Um, and I think we need to recognise, as Mitesh mentioned in, in the COVID example that there are some situations and places in which our leadership style is the right one and others where actually it's something else that's called for so you know i don't think it's the organization necessarily that needs to to own all that i think we can all recognize that different leadership styles are needed for different situations and we can create these these teams that we can put the right person in for a particular situation <laughs> I would because I would say it's, it's actually one of the things that's important in all of this leadership talk is actually having a good team balance so Stephen made the comment that he's not a completer finisher we couldn't work together because I'm not a completer finisher either so you know we, we'd have to find somebody else or Joanna or Mitesh or somebody to help us but actually having that self-awareness is really important within a leader and, and not being afraid to say I, it's not my area of strength yeah. can someone else either help me or someone take this and I think showing some vulnerability as a leader is it's getting the right balance between showing too much and it's not all about you, but actually sometimes it's appropriate. Yeah. Can I just add a short comment on that? Um, and I think bringing it back to something we were talking about earlier, I think when you're facing imposter syndrome, it's really hard to be vulnerable. Mm. You really want to show everybody that you can do and that you can do the job because inside you're worried you can't. Yeah. Um, but I, it's probably been the single biggest thing I've had to learn, which is I can't be any good at this job until I can accept that I'm in this job and someone deemed it to be <laughs> right and considered me to be the right person. But now I have to be able to vulnerably show where I'm no good, where I'm not good enough, where I need yeah. others. Yeah. Um, and also that's been the key to receiving feedback because when I can then show that vulnerability and say, here's something I'm working on, here's something I want to get better at, I see feedback comes when right. people are willing to tell me whether or not I'm doing a good job on that or not. Because yeah. uh, it's very difficult to give generic feedback to anyone, let alone your leader. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thomas, uh, one more question at this yes, point. They really are pouring in here, uh, Jane, the questions. Um, Bill Drysdale's asking what the panel think about charisma as a leadership quality. How oh. important is charisma? <laughs> So who should I pick on? Stephen, you've been quiet for a while. What, what do you probably, think of charisma? Which probably answers that question. If I, <laughs> uh, I, think, I think the point that Mitesh made about um, honesty is actually probably more important. I think people, um, it's the old you can't take sincerity bit. And if you're leading uh, a, a, a large business and a, and a group of people, they need to believe what you're saying. Uh, and there's a there's a having charisma is great, but it's it's only great if people believe what who you are and what you what you're saying to them. So I think that's that would be my view on that. 
Any, any other thoughts? Thank you, Stephen. Any other thoughts from anyone? Yeah, it's sort of scary, the idea of the charismatic leader. And that's, you know, if we, if we feel like we're imposters, if we're trying to be yeah. charismatic leaders, I think the imposter syndrome kicks in even more. But no, I like what Stephen said. I think, and I, and I, and I and experienced that, people feel authenticity um, and that's what they want in a, in a leader. So charisma is great, but it's got to be packaged. It's got to be real with, um, you know, what, you, you, you're, you're the real thing. Well, let, let's leave the questions for now. We, we'll have some time at the end, hopefully. And I, I was just going to um, move the, the discussion on to the importance of sort of opportunities that come along. And Joanna, with you, the kind of turning points and taking advantage of those. So I wonder if you could share some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so, so for me, I, for the first 20 years of my career, I was really the expert. Um, I, I always knew the most about something in the room and that was my comfort zone. Um, and I think I would have just stayed in areas where I was the expert. But for some reason, I was given a role for which I was completely unsuited. Um, I was asked to be head of UK institutional sales, having knowing nothing about sales um, and nothing about the UK market. Um, and it's a whole separate story about why anyone gave me that that job. Um, and so, you know, to start with, it was a it was a car crash um, because I was still wanting to be the expert. And I and I and I just didn't um, I didn't have that expertise. But, um, you know, I had a coach. Um, they found me a coach, basically, because I was I was making a big mess of this. Um, and. I had some good colleagues who helped me and I actually had a very good team who knew the things that I, that I didn't know. And so basically sort of in this, you know, um, forced situation that the leadership came through um, and, it, and it didn't come through um, as quickly as I might have liked, but it came through before I, I'd made a complete disaster of it. And, and I realized that it wasn't my job to be the expert. It was my job to set the strategy. And I was good at that. I was very good at having a strategic direction for a turnaround situation. It was my job to get the right people there. And I was good at bringing people in and, and, and getting the people we did have into the right, right roles and then to help them be successful. Um, so it was sort of under fire that I switched from this um, specialist to this, to this leader. So I think that's... Um, that's always very interesting to me to look back and think, gosh, if that hadn't happened, I probably would, wouldn't ever have ended up here. And then I think um, a second one, I mean, we, we talked a lot about imposter syndrome. So when I first came to HSBC, I had the, I, I said to my husband, I don't know why they're giving me this job. Um, I am almost certainly going to get fired, but I kind of have to say yes to it because it's such an opportunity. And, um, you know, I had, I didn't have quite the 800 people Mitesh talked about, but I had a lot of different teams in different countries um, and different capabilities. And I was given this, you know, I arrived and I was given six weeks to have a plan. And I was going to have to present this plan to a room full of my peers who were actually the scariest audience. So these were the country CEOs who knew far more about this. So I managed to keep calm and I, and I traveled around and I talked to people and I listened and I just, normally I'm quite a driver. I sort of need to know how I'm doing things and I need to be organized. And I just didn't do that. I just let myself absorb and, and I just let myself trust that I had done this before, come up with a vision and, and a strategy and, I, and it would happen. And it did. And I did present within six weeks to this scary roomful. And so that for me is the other message for someone who likes to be quite in control is actually don't always force yourself. Just let things happen sometimes. Be a bit more organic um, and, and have that confidence. So that's, those for me are sort of the two things. I always look back and see that those have shaped the way I approach things now. 
Lovely. Anyone else want to, to chip in on those sort of critical moments that have those opportunities that have were scary at the time? But mm. so I'll, I'll give a similar one to you, Joanna, which maybe is the imposter syndrome, which was when I was offered the, my current role. So it was you know, stepping out of my head of equities and taking on the whole of the uh, whole of the manager research and strategic research. And I remember going outside the office and phoning my husband and saying, I really don't know what I've just done accepting this job. And he was the same. He said, one day at a time. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll work on the strategy together. He's very good at that sort of thing. So, you know, but actually you, you, you just look for those natural points. And over the years, I've looked for internally for, you know, who can help me with this area that I don't understand. And again, not afraid to ask. I'm, I've never been afraid to say in a meeting, I don't understand that. Or can someone explain? Or can someone explain that acronym to me again? Um, so I think having the confidence to ask people to help you again is is really and people like it don't they when you actually ask them to help you they they feel appreciated and and help you on your journey so i think there are a few moments where you have to shut your eyes do what you think is the right thing to do and hope it comes together thank you for that perhaps we could turn to sort of what the to, to a covid question um so it'd be use, interesting to hear from the from the panel how you feel you, what you've learned from kind of going through this COVID-19 experience about being a leader. Have you had to adapt your style, for example? Have you had to do things differently? What have you learned? So perhaps I could start with Mitesh. Sure. Um, so whilst we dealt with um, COVID initially in China, we've got about a dozen employees in China. So we've been talking to them since the end of January, just around Chinese New Year. I guess it still hadn't occurred to me that this would come to the UK and all the rest of the world and we needed to prepare for it. But it was one, one of my COOs who had started worrying about it. And, um, you know, she's self-proclaimed a worrier. She had been stockpiling. She had prepared her nuclear bunker uh, and so on. So she, <laughs> and so she said, we need to be talking about this. We need to be preparing for it. Um, and if I'm honest, I kind of went, feels like a bit unnecessary, but why don't you run with that? And she was absolutely right in, in making sure that we got together and having prepared us through having had different teams prepare for BCP um, and, and kind of business continuity <coughs> so that we could make the decision to move everyone to remote working when we did. Um, so I think it was really important. It was important to recognize that I can't judge my own risk appetite and let that be everything. And I've got to try other things if it's logical, if it makes sense. And, you know, it, and, and in this case, it really was. And it was interesting when it ultimately came to the decision as to when we'd send people home and actually have them remote working. That was again somewhere where I was quite valuable because I was willing to take the risk. Whereas she and others was, were still waiting for data to see, you know, well, you know, are we, are we ready yet? Um, whereas I think we went early. Um, because we were able to. And I think throughout the big lesson has been the importance of d clear directive decision making and clear communication. And that's not my natural style. Um, I'm a bit of a verbose communicator, so clear communication requires practice. Um, and I'm not directive. I see it as a sledgehammer to be used sparingly. But when the whole firm is looking for direction and doesn't know what to do, you've got to be able to do it. And I think that's where that small group to discuss with, but to quickly, and then we had a small agile decision-making group that could make decisions every hour if we needed, if not every day, particularly in those early stages. Uh, so those have been some of my lessons so far. Thank you. Um, Joanna, any, any observations from you? Yes, I think what Mitesh is saying resonates. Um, I, I think for me, one of the things we learned is, you know, the timescales were just crushed with, with COVID, weren't they? So things that we would normally have had three weeks to sort out, we were, we were resolving in a day. And, and the other thing for me was this, you know, we had to be very dynamic in our prioritization because it really did change. The thing that needed to be addressed today was not necessarily the thing that you had to focus on um, tomorrow. And that, again, I've sort of shared, you know, I tend to think more strategically and longer term. And so this having to be very dynamic and, and change very quickly, um, obviously it was, a, it was a very difficult time, but I think it's a valuable thing to learn. Um, and so I'm trying to keep some of that now. Um, so keep strategic vision, but we can be more dynamic um, in terms of how we, we change things, be more agile. Thank you. Deb? 
Anything yeah. to add? No, I, I would agree with all of the comments that, you know, you need to, we need, you know, certainly that first couple of weeks, a bit more directive. And I think it was getting the combination of sort of empathy and economics. So yes, you understood people's fears and the concerns they had. And I agree with you, Mitesh, everybody's view is different, but everybody's view is right because it's their own view. People first, clients we needed to take with us, but we also do have to run a business. So there was this sort of trying to have that short term it's, it, it's very much about the people and then trying to sort of say to people, please do your best. And that's what we've said to people all the way through is our management mantra has been, we want to support you through this time because we're a people business, but we also want to make sure that we have a business for us all to come back to and enjoy at, when, when the time is right. And that management style is, I think, a little bit more directive, more succinct. So I started a, a weekly newsletter on a Friday for everybody. And it's quite hard because... I wanted people to know I felt anxious, but again, I didn't want to make it about me. So I was trying to share enough information, but also being aware of people at home teaching children, you know, two people at home working with two children teaching and trying to be empathetic to the fact that they were doing the absolute best they could and were probably feeling that they weren't delivering what they wanted to deliver. So it was trying to take everybody's views into account, which I, I found, I, Frank, if I'm honest, I found that really draining that first two or three weeks. I really did. And I put my hand up like you, Steve, and I said, I'm going to take a couple of days holiday and I'm going to switch off. So again, leading by example and saying to people, it's okay to switch off in this period. And, and Stephen, any, anything to, to add? Um, I, I'm, I'm slightly different from, from our, the other panelists and I'm not actually in, the, in a leadership position there at the moment. But I think the thing that I really noticed apart from that our people I think have handled it very well is it's not just about what happened in the last few months. It's about the fact that the business culturally, and that's built up over a very long period of time, was able to react quickly. People believed what was said. There was confidence in, uh, in the management team. Um, so as well as, as well as the here and now and dealing with it, there's also the, the, the kind of legacy point of if, you're, if your people trust you, then you're going to have a better result, I think. Okay, thank you. Thomas, should we take a few more questions? There is one relating to COVID, Jane, uh, from uh, Janet Hayes. What have you learned from this period of COVID that you're planning to take forward? It's a really good question. What, what, what do we want to keep that we've learned? I, the agility that Joanna talked about, I think, is probably the key thing. And, and also perhaps suspending our disbelief um, that we can all work from home or we can do things that we perhaps three months ago thought we couldn't. Yeah. I think trying to think about what's the possible. Yeah. Any, any, anything to add to, to that from anyone? The only thing I've found is that um, people showed different skills, um, you know, the way, the way people adapted. Um, unexpected in, in very positive ways and I think that's also interesting um, who, who really rose um, who really came through very strongly in that environment. So you've learned more about some of your colleagues yeah. through this process. Yeah. yeah. I think a really interesting lesson for us with particularly a diversity hat on has been how easy it has been to have people work remotely um, both in supporting what was already a move towards smarter working, but also to access potentially a, an even bigger community of people who can't come into work or can't travel in, whether they be because of physical disabilities or otherwise. I think it's really opened our eyes to what is possible and the limitations we had imposed on ourselves as to what it you had to satisfy in order to be able to work as part of a team. And so we're giving that a lot of thought and we'd love to continue to build on that. Yeah, I think the, um, so the work from home thing is gonna be permanent now. I think we've just made a, sh it's made us make a massive shift. I, I don't, think we're gonna be going backwards on that yeah. now. Great, any other questions, Thomas? A, 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 a one here that I'm sure all the panelists will have a view on, do you have a work-life balance? Do you sleep well? <laughs> <laughs> I generally do, but my house alarm went off at three o'clock this morning, so that wasn't oh, very good. No, no, no. Other than that, I generally see well. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I do a lot of quilting and crochet, as many people know, so I've got a lot of uh, creative hobbies, which I try to do five, ten minutes of a day if I can. Perhaps that's the same as my 
as Mitesh is journaling, I don't know, but uh, I think it's important to have that ability to do something that's different from what I do day to day to keep my sanity. So I do try to switch off and I'm very lucky that I do manage to sleep well. Uh, I, but probably what keeps me most awake is if you have to make those really tough decisions, particularly when individuals are involved in, in any of those tough decisions. That's probably the one thing that does keep me awake. Anyone else want to talk about how they look after themselves in this and, and cope with pressure? I do pretty much what Stephen um, spoke about at the weekends. So I, I will not look at my Blackberry at weekends. And if people really need to speak to me, then I would expect that they can, they can text me um, or call me. Um, and so I will actually get up very, very early on a Monday morning in order to keep my Sunday as a day of, of not working. Um, so that's quite important to me. I think this has been a period where boundaries have been even more mm. important. So I think the one thing you learn very quickly as a leader is your job is never done. It's not about getting to the end of any prescribed to-do list. It's about which balls you're going to allow to fall because you're not going to be able to juggle them all. And I think that probably was the biggest obstacle to sleeping each night initially in the role was just recognizing I'll never be done. I'll never get the job done and being able to recognize I tried my best. Um, and I think that was a really important narrative I had to help myself with, which is to say, I tried my best today. And actually that has to, you know, needs to stop at six o'clock or 7 p.m. and not continue till 9 p.m. or midnight before I admit defeat. Um, so I think those boundaries have been really important and particularly in these last 12 weeks, it's having to be really disciplined to say, this is a time at which I stop. And maybe, and also these are periods where um, I can't be contacted unless it's really urgent or I'm not working. And it's within these hours that I will try my best. And if I consistently can't, then I need to rely on other people and I need to acknowledge that I need others to help. Um, and so I think asking for help would be the other thing that's helped my mental sanity too. I wasn't very good at it before. <laughs> We are getting close to the, uh, the end of the time. So I'm going to hand back. Thank you very much to the panelists, but I'm going to hand back to Thomas now to, uh, to do some kind of wrap up from all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And uh, we had uh, just over uh, 130 people logging in this morning to this session. So on behalf of uh, Jane, Russell and me, Thank you to everyone really for, for logging into today's webinar. Uh, a recording of the session will be made available on our website, as you can see here at uh, leadingfigures.com. And should you wish to find out more about our leadership research program or participate in the project itself, or indeed uh, submit questions or comments on today's session, then please do contact us on info at leadingfigures.com again. In the meantime, though, our sincere thanks go to our guest panellists, Deb Clark, Joanna Munro, Mitesh Sheth, and Stephen Gibb. Very grateful, really, to all four of you, and of course to Jane for such a, a thought-provoking discussion. Thanks again to everyone, and a very good morning.